the basic study we established, I use Q as a standard method in daily practice uh, in the middle of 2000, or so 2005, 2006. And that this is the progress in the implant surface technology over 35 years. And, and of course, the progress then to even further reduce healing periods was made when we, when we moved from the surface topography to the surface chemistry. Also, that's actually what we achieved between 97 and 2004. And it was all based on preclinical research done mainly at University of Bern and at University of San Antonio with, uh, with David Cochran. And you see that, that the papers are published in the best journals and they have had a huge impact, highly citation papers, you see. I don't want to exp explain those papers at all. Huh? But at that time, when we decided to go into a clinical study, we also had to decide how do we measure implant stability. And at that time, we primarily used a, a perio test to check the stability in the long-term function. Then the other groups, you see, they were used an insertion torque value in Newton centimeter, mainly by the Bronner-Mark group. So 30 to 100 Newton centimeter was considered good. However, big, big disadvantage, you do, cannot make a follow-up measurement because you cannot do an insertion talk a second time. And then the resonance frequency analysis, RFA, providing ISQ values, really, that struck our mind, you see. It was introduced by Meredith in 96, and we started to use it in the early 2000s, and it has made a constant improvements. So I think we are in the fourth or even fifth generation now, and I'm very pleased with the progress of this device. So today now we are using these so-called smart packs. We attach them to the implant. It's a metallic, you see, magnetic uh, metallic uh, insertion. And then we measure with the ISQ or machine, you see, we are always doing two readings, one from the buckle and one from the mesial. That's recorded in the charts. And then we, me we measure again at completion of the anticipated healing period. So we have a baseline measurement and we have a follow-up measurement. Sometimes we need another follow-up measurement. That's the beauty of this technique. And I'm very pleased with it. We have done a study that was then published in 2009. It was a study in the posterior mandible implant placing with the into healed ridges. So they were all healed at least six months. A standard implant placement, no bone grafting procedures. And with this acelactive surface, we wanted to load these implants at day 21, huh? at three weeks. Here you see some of the cases. Uh, you see this is a healed ridge in the first molar. You see the implant bed is prepared, the implant is placed. ISQ reading is done, 81, which is very high, but that's typical for healed ridges. We took an impression to produce a provisional crown to be used three weeks later and did a non-submerged healing. You see the periapical. Then at three weeks, patient comes back, everything perfectly healed, ISQ is 83, and then the provisional restoration was installed. And then in, uh, uh, six months later, then uh, the, another reading was done, you see, uh, the second molar has been removed, and then the implant has been restored in private practice by the referring dentist, and you see the two-year follow-up. Here you see the six-year follow-up of this implant doing extremely well, so it's no problem at all. So another patient you see here with initial reading of 80, non-submerged again, periapical. These are all tissue-level implants with a machined neck, very important from my point of view. And you see then at three weeks, 83. And you see then uh, the three-year follow-up implant is doing extremely fine. So in this study, we did more than 50 patients like this. And you see also 56 implants were tested. And you see at, uh, at we had no implant failures during the six months. So we had a 100% success rate. We had at three weeks, two spinning implants at day 21 that required an extended healing period. 
ISQ values were helpful to determine implant stability. Okay, now here I show you how we measure those. Uh, these are the readings of the ISQ. To my knowledge, the first study that really recorded it so detailed. And you see the main author here was Michael Bornstein, who is now full professor at the University of Basel. And you see that we have a couple of others. These were the spinners, you see. Uh, so there we had to extend the healing a little bit. But you see how the ISQ values are increasing over time and that the, the numbers are really doing well. So based on that study, then we decided we're going to use in the future always ISQ 70 as our threshold value. I wanted to be a little bit on the safe side. In the study itself, we used 65. But I said, look, for all these routine cases, 70 seems to be a pretty fair number. So since then, uh, ISQ 70 is our threshold. When a reading is below 70, I'm not going to initiate the loading. If it's above 70, we start go ahead. So you see, these are now the healing periods we are using in daily practice, very practical. When we do an immediate loading, uh, then it's at the same day, day zero, uh, or it's an immediate restoration, actually, because it's out of occlusion. When we go for early loading, we use either a four-week healing period or an eight-week healing period. And when we go longer than eight weeks, then it's called conventional loading. When the reading is not good, then I tell the patient we wait another four weeks. So we always jump from another four weeks bed and measure again. And this really helped us a lot. 